Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, my YouTube viewers. It is Crystal here, and I'm here this afternoon because I want to do a code review for you. Unfortunately, I will not be able to give you a link to the Jupyter Notebook because the people who actually made this competition said that I'm not allowed to make my notebook public. But even though I can't make my notebook public, I'm still going to do a code review on it. Um, and basically, it's a flat price competition on the Kaggle website. And um, I tried to use an artificial neural network, and I also tried to use sklearn as a transform model. And it didn't work with the transform model. I just thought, well, I'll give it a try. I'll see what happens, <clears throat> see if I can improve my score. And the score wasn't improved. So here we go. Here's our code view using TensorFlow's artificial neural network. And um, we'll go through the code, see how we get on. It said uh, the problem statement is get flat prices. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to obtain, predict on flat prices. So we're going to import our libraries. And when we import our libraries, we're going to import NumPy as NP, which creates your NumPy arrays and does linear algebra and numeric computations. We're going to import Pandas SPD, which creates your data frames and also does data processing. We're going to import OS, which goes into the operating system. We're going to import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT, which gives you a graphic visualization of the data. And we're going to import Seaborn as SNS, which um, <clears throat> Is also graphic visualization statistically. We're also going to import sklearn, and sklearn provides your machine learning functionality. And we're also going to import TensorFlow, and that's going to make your artificial neural network. It takes a long time to train the data, so I only train the data for 200 epochs because I don't have the patience to sit there and let it endlessly iterate through. But if you wanted a better score, you could try using more a different amount of neural networks and more epochs. But I I just don't have the patience. If I was like working for a company, then I would have like my computer at work and then I could have uh, the pro the model or the program is churning away in the background while I did other things, but I've just got a tiny little laptop and it's not really that powerful, and so um, I just sit there and wait for it to finish training the data, and it takes a long time to do it, which I'm not really that thrilled about. So after we've imported the libraries, and you know what I've done, we use OS to go in and get the files. So for dir name, comma, dash, comma, file names in os.walk, kaggle.input. For file name and file names, print os.path.join, dir, file name. So we had four files of data, test, and full example. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use pandas to actually read the files. And when we read the files, we're going to make three files with data frames of train, test, and submission. So you can see train here is 19 columns of data, and the last column of data is the price. We look for train info. You see we've got some integers, some floats, and some um, objects. And you can see here on the floats, the floats have a lot of um, floating point values. And so the, because the floats have a lot of floating point values, that obviously is going to affect 
the um, prediction. So what I have done in the program was all of the floats. I rounded it off to two decimal points just to try to reduce the computational time so the system wouldn't crash. And I suppose if you wanted to, like cell height, you could keep that as a float. But if you really wanted to, you could take the total area and you could make that an integer or you can round it to the nearest number. And other area, you can round that to the nearest number. But what I did was I rounded it to two decimal points. But if you wanted to round it to zero decimal points, you could. So here we are in train. So we've got some integers, some floats, and some objects. And those will have to be dealt with. So we're going to check for null values. We don't have any null values, so we don't have to impute them. And then we've got the test file. The test file is the same as the train file, except that you don't have a price because the price is going to be what you're going to have to predict on. So we don't have any null values in the test file either, so that's good. Submission, this is your submission. It's got an index and then it's got a price. So now what I wanted to do is I just wanted to see if the files in the train file were the same, uh, the columns in the train file were the same, coming from the same distribution as the columns in the test file. And so I used from SciPy import stats for call in test stat pd equals stats dot ks underscore two sound train call test call. If pv is less than 0 0.05, print column is not drawn from the same distribution. So we didn't have an output. That means that all of the columns were drawn from the same distribution. Because what happened in one of my recent um, competition questions, um, it uh, it basically the some of the the columns were not from the same distribution, so I couldn't get a decent output. So I decided that I wanted to start checking to see if columns are from the same distribution, and if they're not from the same distribution, then I will just remove those columns. So and then what we do is we analyze train. So you can see this is skewed. It is skewed. I think it's skewed to the left. I'm not sure exactly, but it, it is skewed. Um, and so that's going to make a difference as well whenever you go to make predictions. So we did value counts, and what I wanted to see was how many values were only one of those because if you have values of only one it's going to be difficult to make predictions on it and so i tried to get rid of the values where there was only one but it was too many to do because it was too many to do i just kept the values that were only one in there so you can see this is filtered out so you can see this is exactly the same histogram that we have previously made so now what we're going to do is all of the columns that were of D-type float, what we're going to do is we're going to round them. And we're going to round both the train set and the test set. So that's what we've done. So now everything that's a float has been rounded to two decimal areas. But if you want to, you can round it to zero. Just round it to is, except for cell height might be a bit different, difficult, but like you could round other area to zero or you could round total area to zero, but it's up to you. You could give it a try, see if the score improves. And now what we're going to do is we're going to print the number of unique values in each column of data. So after we printed the number of unique values in each column of data, um, I used Seaborn to um, 
make a few charts. So now we've got the rooms count. So you can see, like, generally, for the most part, the more rooms you have, the higher the price is going to be. So that's pretty self-explanatory. We do the bath count. The more bathrooms you have, the uh, higher the price is going to be. We check for gas. Gas is about the same whether you have gas or not. We check for hot water. Hot water is about the same whether you have water or not. We check for central heating. You get a little central heating is the price is a little bit higher if you've got central heating. Now we check for extra area type name. So you get something called logia. I don't know what that is. And a balcony, but that's about the same. Check the district name. So some areas, the price is more expensive depending upon the area that you're living in. For example, is Moscow. The Moskovsky is more pricey than, shall we say, Kirovsky. So I don't know why they say Moskovsky. I don't know where Moskovsky is. I don't know if it's Moscow or if it's another one. But we'll just say Moskovsky. It seems like Moscow to me, but we never know because I don't speak that language. Now we do a scatter plot of the total area. So you can see this is an unusual looking scatter plot, but that's your scatter plot of the total area. And you can see the higher the area, the higher the price is going to be. We do a scatter plot of the ceiling height, but it's hard to derive anything from that scatter plot. We do a scatter plot of the year. It's hard to derive anything from that scatter plot. And now what we do is we do a heat map. And you can see on the heat map, uh, most of the uh, columns or features are not very highly correlated because you can see the black in there. But we can check the correlation. If you want to see what the correlation is, you can. And so what we did was we submitted code to remove the um, columns that have a high correlation, but there was not any high correlated columns, so none were removed. And so now you can see we have 19 columns total. Total. We decide to drop the ID, and the reason why we drop the ID is because um, it is um, every row of data is uh, indexed in the data frame, so you don't really need the ID. So now what we're going to do is we're going to encode the features. So for the train and the text set, if the column is an object column, then we're going to ordinal encode it. And you notice that you have to re reshape the column of data to negative one one before it will work. If you don't reshape the column of data, it won't work. So now we've ordinal encoded all of the object columns. And because of that, um, now you've just got numeric columns. If I did a, a train info, it would just either be an integer or a float. And the same thing with test. Now we define our x and our y variables. So y equals train dot pop price, x equals train. So now we split our data set up into training and validation sets. And uh, we use SK Learns Train Test Split to do that. So you can see we only have the the train, the test, and the validation, there are 17 columns of data. So now we get into the TensorFlow. And then when we get into TensorFlow, you can see that we're working on TensorFlow 2.11 version. And we import the TensorFlow and Keras to do what we need to do. We're going to standardize the data. Normalizer equals normalization. Axis equals negative 1. That means that you're standardizing all of the columns. Normalizer.adapt 
So it's going to be NP array X train. So you're normalizing X train. So it gives you the mean of all of the columns in X train. So now what you can do is you can see what X train is without normalization and with normalization. And now what we do is we define our uh, neural network. We define our model, which is a sequential neural network. You see we called it flat prices. The first row is going to be normalizer. The first hidden layer is going to be dense. And I picked 25 um, neural networks for each column. But if you wanted to, you could try more neural networks. You could try like maybe 40 or 50 neural networks and see if that improves your score. But again, it's going to take a long time to train the data, so it depends on how much patience you have. So input dim equals x train dot shape one. That's how many columns you've got. Activation is read through. Name is hidden one. And then the next column of data, we've got um, activate 25 neural neurons. Activation is redo and name is hidden two. And the next one is model.add dense one. Activation is linear and name is output. And then we have a model summary. What I will say is if you wanted to, you could try to put in some dropout to see if that improved the score. But again, you're going to spend a lot of time uh, training your data. You know, so like if you're working for a company, a company might allow you to do that because then you can in, you can be training your data, but in the background you can be doing some other things while you're training your data. But in my situation, it's a little bit different, different because if I was trying to do other things while I was training the data, I might actually crash my little laptop. So now what we do is we compile the model, the loss is mean squared error, optimizer is Adam, and metrics is MAE, that's mean absolute error. We set it up for early stopping and model checkpoint, and then what we do is we train the data. So history equals model.fit, x train, y train, epochs equals 200. You can set it up for more epochs, but it'll take longer. Validation data equals x val, y val. Batch size is 32, callbacks is early stopping MC. So what we do is we train it for 200 epochs, and I'm sure it could have trained for longer, but I didn't really have the time. And then so now what we do is we have, we create a little graph that tells you your loss and your MAE, but it just went off the, the loss and the MAE just like went off the graph so it doesn't even show anything here. We check our y thread equals model dot predict x val. So this is the validation set. And so and then you can see what your RMS is. That's your root mean squared error. So that's one seven eight oh three nine oh that's your root mean squared error for that. And then you can see the um where the predicted values fall up against the actual values. And you can see that it doesn't look that bad. The actual values are a little bit close to the predicted values, although you do have like definitely one little outlier here. That's an outlier. So what we do is we create a data frame where we compare the actual values to the predicted values so you can look at them and see what they look like. And now we're going to predict on the test set. And then I made a little histogram of the test set. So this is what the predictions of the test set look like. And then we prepare the submission to be submitted to Kaggle. So that's our submission. And when I submit it to Skaggle, I had a score of 1778620. And it's really high, but if we come over here and actually look at the uh, competition, look on the leaderboard, we've got two teams. 
and uh, my best score was 1778620 and the test submission I'm not sure what test submission is I don't know if that is actually a person who's just given given the Kaggle the name test submission or if it is actually a test submission but they had four entries and they did it three hours ago and then you've got something here I don't know what that is I don't know uh, if that's just what Kaggle decided it should be but um, my score was 1778620 that was my highest score so, um, and you can see over here code, we don't have any code because they will not allow me to make my code public and because they will not allow me to make my code public, I can't do anything about it. Look on my data or look on my code, look on my work. So there we go. So what we'll do is we'll come over here where it says leaderboard and it says submissions and then that's the one. That's the one that we used. So that's it. That's it for this particular code review. I showed you everything that I could possibly show you and then I can't make it public because they won't allow me to make it public. I can show you that they won't allow me to make it public. So you've got making this notebook public will be locked until the competition ends. So I can't make it public. But I don't know what they're going to say about me doing the code review, but I did the code review anyway. So uh, that concludes this uh, code review. So thank you so much for watching the code review. If you like my video, please like, subscribe, and share. If you want to be notified whenever I make a new video, please tap onto the bell button next to the subscribe button thank you so much for watching my code review uh, i'm trying very hard to speak slowly so you can take everything in because one of the things that happened is whenever i speak quickly i get my words muddled up and i don't want to do that i don't want to muddle my words up so i will try to speak slowly in my videos so you can get the most out of them thank you for watching my video i look forward to making more videos for you in the future